So African Americans, simply by virtue of being poor, they're going to be overrepresented in the criminal justice system. So we should forget about the class aspect to it. It's not because you're black, it's because you're poor. But then on top of that, the racism, of course. Uh, look, I'm not going to deny any of that. It'd be stupid to deny it. Of course, that's true. There are very few uh, black tennis players because there are very few black tennis courts, you know, tennis courts in black neighborhoods. Of course, that's true. Same thing with swimming. How many swimming pools do you find in, in you know, in uh, poor neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, whatever you want to call it? Of course, I see that, but I don't. I don't go for the idea that, let's say, there are blacks represent ten percent of the population. But they're only only 9.5% of the legal profession. Aha! Racism. We need affirmative action. No, it may not be racism. There could be disparities without racism. No, it could just be whatever kind of cultural explanation, whatever kind of fluke. I don't know what it is. But there's a way of saying that whenever there's a disparity, there's got to be racism. And then it leaves out any possibility of individual responsibility. Uh, cultural difference and things like that, which might not totally explain the phenomena and maybe not predominantly explain the phenomena, but it's an element. It's an element and we shouldn't uh, forget that element. And there are elements of, as I said, the surveys show Asians study to do their homework two hours a night. In African-American homes is about a half hour. And then there's a reverse proportion of time spent watching television. No, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Why shouldn't I be perfectly honest? I spent a lot of, much too much time as a kid watching television. You want to hear that? When my friends were reading, I spent much too much time. And you know what? I pay for it till this day. Because a lot of what you achieve and not achieve in life goes all the way back to the use of those years between three and 13. That's a fact. Those years are fundamental in how you turn out in life. So I freely admit, I spent way too much time as a kid chasing girls, trying to be popular, trying to wear nice clothes, and that had real consequences. To this day, and I'm going to be 70, I curse myself for all the idiocies I squandered my time on as a kid. Maybe in part I say it was okay because I got it out of my system. And then after I got out of my system, I became very serious about life. But there are consequences. If you're gonna spend two hours doing homework a night versus a half hour, or in reverse, spending five hours a night watching television versus one hour watching television. In 1970 was the last time I ever watched television. Yes, that's right, more than a half century ago. I got rid of the TV. I got to college and I said, you know what, you're an adult now. You're not gonna watch television anymore. Those are decisions you make and they have, they have, I'm not gonna say positive or negative, but they have real consequences. And to try to ignore that, to pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah, in some cases it didn't exist. Frederick Douglass, he didn't start reading till he was 18, 19, and he still became a brilliant stylist, a brilliant orator. Yeah, some people, well, they can do it. But in general, uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves about lost years, and those years are vital. To get back to Robin DiAngelo, what do you, what do you think about, um, so in the book, like, like it's supposed to be, I guess, a liberal uh, view of race and racism and whatnot. But and maybe this is just an extension of liberalism and I'm just being naive, but it's also highly, highly authoritarian. One thing that's fascinating is although she is a consultant and this is how she makes her money, you know, besides writing of books, she keeps peppering these anecdotes in her book uh, about these workshops that she convenes uh, full of like white participants and black participants about racism, anti-racism. Again and again, she alludes to some sort of racist incident in this or that workshop, but very rarely does she actually get into the specifics of what these incidents are? So she's like, you know what? I don't even want to deal with this. I'm just going to 
uh, assume that it's racist. I'm going to have the reader assume the same way. And also, by the way, if you start arguing back, and she does say this part explicitly, if you start arguing back either as a reader or as a participant in one of these workshops, that's simply because you have a lot of racist feelings. So not only does she just totally you know, sidetrack any possible conversation, she also kind of really gatekeeps a very, very specific interpretation of racism. If I were to design a book and an anti-racist program that is specifically tailored to get as many people against you as possible, get as many people against the notion of anti-racism as possible, make people as resentful as possible so they can't be part of any real long-term political project, it really would look like this book. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. I found the whole premise of what she's doing so completely ridiculous. It's just obviously, it's a business. DEI has become a business. They hire all these people. Companies pretend to be fighting racism. People make a living off of it. They use this expression, we're interrupting racism. What, what does that mean? What do you mean you're interrupting racism? Stop. Racism, stop. just a moment's reflection. It's just the stupidest thing on God's earth. How do you interrupt racism? What does it mean to interrupt racism? And you there's also to... there's also an assumption there, right? If you interrupt, uh, it's almost as if you are expecting it to come back in full force, as if like you're hitting pause in a cassette or something. And then right. it's just continues on as it always did. Racism is as omnipresent and omnipotent as they make it out to be then interrupting racism is the equivalent of a twig on a train track interrupting a high-speed locomotive heading in the twig's direction. Mm -hmm. If it's really as omnipotent and uh, omnipresent as they claim, how could you interrupt it? How could you interrupt it? Who even needs her? Workplaces nowadays are overwhelmingly integrated. If you have differences of opinion, okay, there may be a human, oh God, human relations, no, I take that back. Then they should learn to have the courage and the, the, uh, the spine to just call it out. You say, you know, as people do nowadays, I don't like what you just said. Okay, fine. And then you can argue it out, you can harbor resentment. I don't know what you could do, but the idea that you're fighting racism with these stupid sessions of hers, uh, just it just strikes me as what does this have to do with the real world? That's that you you yes you want to have a um, you want to have a uh, congenial workplace that's true, and people should be able to express their differences and the fact that they feel insulted. Look, guess what? People feel insulted by a thousand different things. People in general, myself included, can be thin-skinned. Somebody can make a reference to uh, Jesus, did you see her on TV? She is so fucking fat. And then there is a fat person in that room. Are they going to feel hurt? Yeah. Or somebody says, you know, I went out with this guy last night. I couldn't believe when the door opened. He was so fucking short. And then there are going to be short people in the room, and they're going to be hurt. You know, hurt, uh, self-consciousness, thin skin, skinnedness. That's all part of life. You can't eliminate it. And guess what? If you say that person you saw on the television set that like that last night she was so fucking large, that's not going to make a fat person feel better. You know, that's just life. And to the extent that people say things which give offense because of race, you know, some of it should be called and some of it. All right, you could say, you know, I didn't like that. I, a lot of times, because, you know, given my politics, I'm around people who say all sorts of things about Jews, and they feel that they got a free right because of who I am, you know? They say all sorts of things. Sometimes I think they go, they go a little bit over the top. 
And sometimes, you know, rarely, rarely, but I do. I'll say, no, I didn't, I don't really like that. But most of the time I say, oh, okay, I've known this guy for ages. He's a nice guy. I don't really agree with what he's saying, but it's not the end of the world. Let's just move on. So I don't see what's the function, aside from making money, what's the function of these people? You have you have work relationships and you try to in, work them out individually. And sometimes you might talk to another coworker and say, he or she said that. And then they'll say, okay, I think we should talk to them about it because that's really wrong. That's just, you know, it seems to me that just comes with the turf and it's part of being life. And I don't see any function she serves. I don't even understand. She acts like black people need her mm -hmm. as an interlocutor. Well, guess what? Black people, we're told, are very articulate. Why do they need her? Why do they need her? They can't speak for themselves. Black people are so shy. They're so reserved. They're so reticent. Not in my experience. Not in my experience. They're quite able to defend themselves, just like everybody else is able to defend themselves. I don't even see the, pur the purpose of these DEI folks, except to wreak terror, where everybody's walking on eggshells, um, terrified 